so, so next is Steve Moore. He's, a, he's an attorney uh, and he's been working since the 80s, the mid 80s, uh, in the, the subject of the Native American church and the right to use peyote uh, here in the US. Uh, he's also the founding board member of the Indigenous Peyote Conservation uh, Initiative uh, and uh, part of the Native American Rights Fund. So give it all up to Steve Moore. Thank you, Ben, and big welcome to Steve. And a nice reminder to the audience that as we do grow our numbers today, that you please do respect these aisles that we have taped. It's really important that we do have an emergency exit that includes for you in case you have to go to the bathroom as well, anything like that. Uh, do scoot in, huddle up. If you want to talk to Ben, he'll be outside. And welcome, Steve. Together? Uh, hello. I need to indicate the time, so do, do you want to do like 50 minutes? I talked to Andy, so yeah. Oh, okay. She's got it okay. All right. Great. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and get back to the start of my presentation. Um, some people are leaving, some people are coming in. Uh, I'm going to start, and maybe the base across the street will. Uh, uh, subside for a while. Um, I'm Steve Moore with the Native American Rights Fund in Boulder, Colorado. Can people hear me in the back? Yes. Good? Okay. So uh, I wanted to thank the uh, Zendo Project, the Home Foam, Home Foam, Foam Home, <laughs> and uh, MAPS for inviting me and the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative uh, to present today. And also, the uh, Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative uh, would not be possible without the support of uh, Dr. Bronner's and the River Sticks Foundation and other uh, philanthropists um, with huge hearts. So, for those of you who don't know, this is uh, peyote growing in a natural habitat in the state of Texas. And, um, I will say uh, the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative has both a Texas uh, front and a front in Mexico. We work with the Huichole communities in Mexico. Uh, most of my talk today is going to focus on Texas where I'm, I'm doing my work, uh, but I, I really do need to point out that a very important part of this initiative is going on in Mexico with the Huichole people. and. Um, a, a nonprofit organization down there that supports their work and helps to organize them and develop strategies for land management um, and sustainability of peyote in Mexico. The, the photographs that I'm going to show you today are sensitive. Um, there are pictures taken of Native Americans in Texas uh, in various aspects of ceremony, not inside a teepee. Uh, but making offerings on the ground and harvesting. Um, I'm showing you these with the permission of our clients uh, because this educational component of the project is vital uh, for, for us and our work. So what is IPCI? Uh, first and foremost, it's about empowering indigenous communities. And I say that because in the United States and in Mexico, certainly, there is a legacy, there's a history and legacy of oppression, uh, forced assimilation and acculturation, uh, dispossession of land and natural resources, water, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, spirituality is another component of that. And I'm going to be touching on some sensitive topics with this group today. Um, and, and, and I'm happy to be here because I think that the people who come to a place like Burning Man and who are interested in the power uh, and the spirit uh, and in plant medicine uh, are, are in particular people who can take away from this presentation uh, an awareness and respect for uh, the sacrament peyote and what it means to indigenous people uh, in North America. So the education uh, component again, the conservation component uh, I will talk about today too as well, 
Uh, we have a crisis in Texas, a crisis that's been growing for the last two decades, I would say, uh, and we call it a supply and demand crisis because the popularity of the peyote religion among indigenous people and among non-indigenous people is growing. The interest is growing. And uh, at the same time, and I'll talk about the crisis on the supply side, there are land management practices in Texas and certainly in Mexico that are threatening the very habitat, the very existence of the, the species of peyote uh, that, that reside in those two areas. Peyote is a very difficult plant to, to propagate, to germinate, and to grow uh, in a greenhouse setting or in the natural environment. From the time you, you germinate a seed, it takes 10 years before you can responsibly harvest that peyote. And when you harvest, you cut the crown off the top of the peyote. If you dig too far down under the surface, you're going to destroy that plant. And I'll show you some pictures of a peyote that have been improperly harvested. Um, and the land management practices of the ranchers in Texas with whom we are beginning to work um, have been very destructive to ha the habitat and the peyote in Texas. The, <clears throat> having a little trouble with the sunlight there, the regeneration and the reconnection the spiritual reconnection element of our project is likewise equally important. Um, I will talk a little bit about the history of the disconnection and the reasons for the disconnection of indigenous people in uh, the United States in particular from the land areas in Texas where the peyote grows, propagates, uh, and, and where uh, harvests, pilgrimages and harvests have occurred in the past and, and what has happened to those harvests and, and that traditional way of harvesting over the, over the years. So the peyote religion has been around for thousands of years. A couple examples of rock art which honestly uh, I, I can't interpret. This one's a little easier to interpret. You can see the peyote buttons. The deer is a sacred animal. Uh, in the peyote uh, uh, cosmology, and uh, you can, so you can see the, the peyote represented uh, in that deer. This one's a little harder to interpret um, because of the, the finer detail, but this rock art uh, is uh, several thousand years old in South Texas. Here's a map that depicts the range where peyote is found naturally. You can see that uh, certainly about 90% of the habitat for peyote uh, is found south of the, the uh, border between the United States and Mexico. The Rio Grande River forms uh, the border uh, between the two countries uh, and it's depicted in the, in the purple there. So for Native Americans in the United States, uh, they do not have legal access to peyote in Mexico. There are no importation agreements between the two countries. We have talked about importation agreements, but um, the relationships between the native people in the United States and Mexico uh, are evolving. Uh, they're not very well established. I know that roadmen, peyote roadmen in the United States have been going to Mexico for my entire legal career and, and more than that. Um, to establish these traditional relationships. But the last thing that our clients want to do is to go to the State Department in the United States to try and work out an importation agreement with Mexico uh, and work with the Mexican government and, and try and do that behind the backs of the indigenous people in Mexico. I mean, talk about a way to absolutely destroy a relationship before it ever gets solidly off the ground. So, what we are trying to do in this project is take care of the peyote uh, in Texas. And I'll talk about the, the strategies and the ways that we're doing that. In my legal career, in addition to Native American church and peyote work, I've done a lot of work in the Columbia River Basin with salmon fishing tribes. Uh, we all know the story of the decimation of the buffalo in the 19th century. The decimation of the salmon in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, is equally deplorable, uh, but in some ways more complex because of the, the, the construction of all the dams, uh, the culverts, um, 
the, the, the diversions of water out of the stream and river systems in the Pacific Northwest that have robbed the habitat of, of the water that it needs for salmon uh, propagation. And so several species, many species of salmon in the Pacific Northwest are now threatened or endangered under the Federal Endangered Species Act. When that happens, then the, the, the tribes in the Pacific Northwest are told how many salmon they can harvest on an annual basis or on a salmon run by salmon run basis. And so our clients and we have been seeing this growing crisis in Texas with peyote and the habitat, like the salmon habitat in the Northwest, we're trying to get ahead of the curve through this project. The complicating factor in Texas is all of the peyote is found on private land. The ranchers in Texas uh, have been uh, living and, and thriving on those ranches for multiple generations. They, they are on Spanish or Mexican land grants. The ranchers that we are working most closely with have been on their land for over 200 years. But all the peyote is behind barbed wire now. So, uh, and it, it's, peyote is not subject to the protections or the restrictions of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the, the federal ESA does not control plant species or protect plant species on private land. Uh, so uh, we, have, we have a very unique, interesting, but complex situation and difficult situation in Texas when it comes to trying to control uh, and improve the land management practices in Texas and thus the sustainability of peyote. So I think I've covered this slide, um, but you know, just to, to refresh, we have a conservation crisis, we have the spiritual disconnection. I am going to talk about that a little bit more. The, the legacy of European conquest and, and all of, that's gone with it, uh, cultural oppression and assimilation. Um, but on the positive side, we're trying to change all of that. We're trying to turn all of that around. Um, this is an exercise in cultural sovereignty. And for Native American peoples in North America, sovereignty is uh, just about the most important guiding light. All facets of sovereignty, control of your land, control of your people, control of the natural resources, uh, control of internal relationships, control of external relationships. All of that is what makes up sovereignty. And, and this is an indigenous cultural or traditional element of sovereignty, is to be able to, be able to control uh, this spiritual resource, this sacrament, that your life ways depend on. <clears throat> so the slides have gotten a little bit off kilter, but we'll figure that out as we go along. Here are a couple pictures of older generations of, in this case, Navajo, and a younger generation granddaughter. Uh, it's one of the things that I think we're most proud about now in the project is in the last year we've had two children's harvests on ranch lands in Texas where the children have gone out with their parents and their grandparents, made prayer offerings on the ground, and been able to harvest. These grandparents, in contrast, this is the first time they've ever come to, been able to come to Texas to go on to the ranch land and actually participate in harvest of peyote for their own personal use. I'll get into the history of that a little bit too. But what a moving experience for those of us in the project to be able to be with these people, these elderly people, some of them in their 80s, see them kneeling on the ground, sobbing crying out of joy because not only they but their grandchildren are able to make this reconnection to the sacrament, to their holiest of sacrament. So, uh, and I don't know if we can do anything about the slides being a little bit off. There we go, that did it. We got a great staff here. <laughs> So, I mean, t uh, back, back in time, I think in three slides, I'm going to try and cover about 500 years of history. Uh, beginning in the, the late 16th century and early 17th century, 
the Spanish government and, of course, the Catholic Church looked at uh, the indigenous use of peyote in, in uh, the New World, uh, what they called New Spain, and it, it represented a real threat to, the, to Catholicism and uh, to Christianizing and civilizing uh, these savages that were found in the New World. And so the first, some of the first actions of the church at that time were to put out these edicts, papal bulls they're called, today we might call them bullshit, um, <laughs> papal bulls prohibiting the con consumption of peyote. So that's, you know, they, they figured out early on that uh, what they had to do was, was separate these people from their traditional ways, their traditional belief systems to, to, to turn them into good Christians. In the United States, uh, in about the last century, certainly, um, propaganda campaigns, and I know Ben referred to, you know, the clash between ancient traditions and, and modern drug laws. And so here we have, in the 19th century, uh, a, a conspiracy between the federal government, state governments, the church organizations, and, and the YMCA of all organizations to try and stamp out the use of peyote among Native Americans uh, in the United States. This was certainly happening before this newspaper article, and this was probably from about 80 years ago, um, when Native Americans were first um, forced onto reservations through the treaty-making era. Um, the, the Bureau uh, of Indian Affairs uh, at the time, the uh, Interior Department, outlawed all religious uh, traditions, uh, uh, vision questing, uh, sun dancing, um, and certainly peyote. So there were, there were, uh, they were made crimes under federal law. It's a great picture I found of a 19th century uh, peyote roadman, traditional drum still used today. Famous uh, Comanche chief uh, and roadman, Quanna Parker, uh, who helped to popularize the religion in Oklahoma uh, over a century ago and led to the organization uh, of what is now called the Native American Church. Uh, now, the, the adoption of and taking on of the name church by the peyote religion was, as you might imagine, a way of protecting it. Um, these churches, as they, as they became known, were actually registered under the laws of the state where, where they were located. Some elements of Christianity were incorporated into religious practices in the peyote religion so that um, some roadmen would bring Bibles in and, and, and crosses in, and they would have ceremonies around the, the major Christian religions uh, or, or, or uh, observations like uh, Easter and Christmas. They tried to take on, incorporate some elements of Christianity, again, as another protective mechanism. This is a great shot of a property um, in South Texas near Mirando City um, that was um, the home of a famous woman named Amada Cardenas and her husband, Claudio. Um, and they were, um, they were people that lived down there. They were of Mexican ancestry, probably had in some indigenous blood. They had the relationships with the ranchers so that in the old days when native people would come to Texas to pilgrimage uh, for their harvest, they would always stop at Amada's house and she's, she has become like the Mother Teresa of the Native American Church. She would set up the, the, the arrangements with the, uh, the ranchers and tell the, 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 the Native people where to go. And in the old days, they would actually go out and camp on the ranch lands and with the permission of the ranchers, harvest, have ceremony, and then take peyote home. And, and, and it was really through the Cardenas family. So this has become a shrine. Uh, for the Native American church. A, a couple examples of peyote art, which I found off the internet. I'm not gonna say a lot about the, the drug laws. I mean, Ben did a, a great job of that, but um, 
1970, the Controlled Substances Act was passed in the United States, uh, made peyote a Schedule I controlled substance. Um, at the same time, the, the Drug Enforcement Administration enacted a regulation which exempted peyote from Schedule I uh, criminal prosecution for members of the Native American church using peyote in bon bona fide religious ceremonies. So the Native American church in the United States has benefited from that protection under federal law, although it's not enshrined in the statute, but it is found in a federal regulation and still there today. Now, I, what happened in Texas at the same time is states passed their counterpart drug laws um, setting up scheduling of drugs, and peyote in Texas became a Schedule I drug. Now, as you might imagine, a, a problem immediately resulted because, again, peyote is the only location, or Texas is the only location for peyote in the United States. So um, initially, and it took a court action in Texas to declare that Native Americans had the right to possess and use peyote uh, before Texas actually amended its statute uh, to, to provide the same kind of exemption for uh, the religious use of peyote. At the same time, though, what, what uh, I, I, and I think it was done with the best of intentions, but because peyote became a Schedule I controlled substance in Texas, Texas then set up a regulatory system, a licensing system for people who uh, could um, buy and sell peyote. So nowadays we have these people called peyoteros or licensed distributors in Texas. They have lease arrangements with the ranchers, so they do the harvesting and then they sell to the Native American uh, people. So, through that system, and, and uh, unfortunately, I mean, there's a good side and a bad side to it. Um, fortunately, on the good side, Native American people under this new system could actually pick up the phone and call the peyoteros and have peyote mailed to them. If you want to pay enough money, they will overnight peyote to you for your ceremony. Um, the bad side is, thus began the disconnection the spiritual disconnection because with the new Perotero system, um, people no longer had to make the pilgrimages to Texas to invest the time to go down to make the spiritual offerings on your knees to, to the spirit, to the sacrament, and to do your harvesting. And, and, and so you see a breakdown, an erosion of uh, a very important aspect of this whole you have to be careful where you walk up here. Very, you know, a very critical component of this belief system. Um, and, and so we're dealing with the, the effects of that through this project today. Here's a uh, photograph of one of the peoteros, Mr. Morales, in Rio Grande City, uh, right on the border. Um, he's a wonderful old man. He's I would say near death these days. Um, and uh, another uh, gentleman, Salvador Johnson, uh, probably in his mid-70s mid now. Both of their businesses have been taken over by their children and grandchildren. Uh, we, we trusted Salvador and Mr. Morales, Maro Morales, we don't trust their children and their grandchildren because we think that they are involved in the black market trade of peyote. Um, and uh, we're not wild about the current harvesting practices uh, from these guys. Nowadays, and I, I wouldn't pretend for a moment to tell you that this is a lucrative business. Uh, if anyone has ever tried to harvest peyote, <laughs> uh, you probably would have had to been trespassing in Texas to do it, or, or maybe in Mexico. Um, not, it's not an easy undertaking. Um, the heat index down there right now is probably 115 degrees. Uh, and and, and these, these folks typically harvest in the, the winter months. February is usually a, a good harvesting month. I would say no harvesting goes on this time of year uh, for all intents and purposes. But um, the, 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 um, 
the harvesting practices um, have, because of the decline in the, the population of peyote, the harvesting practices have gotten more, gotten more extreme. The peyote is harvested too frequently, it's too small, uh, and it, the harvesting is actually done improperly, and we're seeing more and more evidence of actual killing of, of peyote plants. And here's one of the most dramatic examples that I can show you. If, if you take the, the crown, as you would call it, the crown of the peyote, the crown of the peyote and harvest it right at ground level, that is a successful harvest. Um, it will regenerate in about four years' time to uh, a, a size that uh, is worthy of harvesting again. If you, if you harvest it more quickly than that, you can actually kill the plant. Um, this is particularly insidious because they're taking the whole plant. Now what we're seeing, another practice of these peoteros in Texas, is they take these like potato chip machines and they will cut the peyote into fine chips and dry it and they're selling the entire peyote. Now the trick there that I don't think our clients were, were even aware of uh, a couple of years ago is that the root is not psychoactive. In fact, when you get about two inches down from the top of the crown, the, the plant is no longer has any psychoactive properties. So you can be chipping a peyote and 85% of it is not psychoactive, but the peyoteros are selling it as if it's the good stuff. <laughs> so it's certainly a way to rip people off um, and to destroy uh, the entire plant in the process. This is a roadman from South Dakota that we work very closely with, Sandor Iron Rope. Uh, and he bought a, a bag of a thousand peyote buttons. This, is, this picture was taken last April. And we went through the entire bag of a thousand peyote buttons. And all of these were, I would say, about a quarter size in diameter. Now, that's criminal to be cutting peyote that's only a quarter size in diameter because you have killed the plant by doing that. And, and the peyoteros, the people that they hire to harvest, don't have any investment in proper harvesting techniques. They're being paid by the piece. So if they go out and harvest a thousand buttons, they may be paid a hundred bucks. Our clients then pay fi the peyotero 500 bucks. Um, so the system is not set up to reward proper harvesting or careful harvesting. It's set up to reward rape and run, hit and run kind of practices. The peace pickers that work for uh, the peyoteros also are notorious for jumping barbed wire fences, trespassing, and the ranchers that we work with uh, have, are at their wit's end in Texas dealing with um, the trespassing. You can, you can build a barbed wire fence eight feet tall, and, and some of them build very high barbed wire fences because they have African antelope and deer that they bring over, and they have hunting. It's a very lucrative pro, uh, business down there for the ranchers, um, uh, the hunting uh, licenses and the hunting season. Um, but but a, a picker will just take out a pair of snips, cut the barbed wire, and go right on through. So it doesn't matter how high the fence is. Cattle ranching is uh, a very lucrative business down there as well. Um, they bring in a grass from Africa that is very invasive. It takes very little water to, uh, to grow. Um, when I've been down there in April, the, the, it's called buffle, buffle grass. The buffle grass can be knee high in April. So it's, it's a very effective grass for feed for cattle. But in order to clear the land so that they can, they can plant this African grass, they root plow. So they take large machinery, you know, with these big forked prongs and just drive right through the peyote habitat, rip it up, you know, 
pile it into big piles and burn it. Um, once the buffalo grass, uh, it's so invasive that once it's planted, it thrives where you plant it, but then it will also move into the habitat where the peyote uh, is still found. The ranchers, the smart ones, have put rows of, of the buffalo grass and kept rows of the brush um, to, to leave some habitat for the deer and antelope that they then let the hunters come in and hunt. Uh, but the buffalo grass will get into that habitat that's left with the brush and, and it gets underneath the, the plants and, and wipes out the habitat for the peyote. So that's another problem that we're beginning to uh, an education campaign with the ranchers. And then, of course, we've got the cattle um, doing their thing, right? They will not eat peyote. Um, but they get, they, they, uh, unintentionally, they will walk in the peyote and, and you know, destroy it at, at times. About the only living thing that we've seen other than humans that eat peyote are these little snails. And I'm not a biologist I, uh, or a scientist. I don't know why you find little snails living in the desert in Texas, but the landscape is littered with these white, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah. So uh, the the snails are a bit of a problem, and then you got the javelina, the wild pigs that will go in and root up and and tear up, pretty unintentionally, but will tear up the peyote. They don't really eat it. And then in recent years, we have wind turbines, wind farms. It's another form of income for the ranchers, and um, unfortunately. There's a ridge line uh, where peyote is known to uh, thrive most successfully, and it, it happens to be a, a place where the wind is very, very uh, abundant in Texas. And, and so in the last five years, we've seen probably a thousand wind turbines go up in this 40-mile stretch uh, along this ridge line. And they build the roads out to the wind turbines. They build the concrete pads for the turbines. You know, and, and when that's done uh, in peyote country, then the peyote is destroyed. We've not been able to get ahead of this problem either uh, by um, you know, going in and allowing uh, uh, our people to transplant the peyote before the, concrete, the roads and the concrete pads are put in. And then I mentioned, this has a reference to Mexico City, I, which is not relevant here, but I, I found this on the internet, the, the black market. Um, there, there is a lot of um, picking that, that takes place in Texas off the books. Uh, some of it may be through the peoteros and, and their children and grandchildren. Um, but I know what, the times I've been in Rio Grande City, you can drive around in the back roads along the border, there will be pickups parked on, the, on those back roads with a little bitty cardboard sign, a guy sitting on the tailgate, and he's, you know, he's trespassed, he's picked peyote, and, he, and he's selling it um, black market. Um, these are people that need a source of income, they need jobs, some of them may be undocumented, um, but you know, they're human beings and they need to survive, but they're, they're really you know, ripping off the peyote uh, down there in South Texas as a result of this. So getting into some more of the beautiful pictures here. Um, <clears throat> this is again from the children's harvest. So IPCI, a little, little bit more about IPCI now. Um, we knew that first and foremost, this had to be an indigen indigenous-led uh, nonprofit. So we're now established under state and federal law. Texas and federal law is 501c3 organizations. Uh, we have the leaders of the four largest Native American church organizations in the United States uh, and NIRICA in Mexico uh, as board members uh, of IPCI. 
I'm on as a legal representative, uh, uh, a gentleman from the River Sticks Foundation, and uh, then we also have a cactologist um, in Texas uh, who's on our board of directors. <clears throat> so Stephen Benally, Sandor Iron, Sandor Iron Rope, Andrew So, and Eugene Black Bear represented these organizations. The first one is uh, the uh, Navajo, Ajebe Nagaha of Dene Nation, Sandor from the Native American Church of South Dakota, Andrew from the Native American Church of North America, and Eugene Black Bear from the Native American Church of uh, Oklahoma. Th these four organizations probably represent about 90% of the chapters, the Native American Church chapters in the United States. And then Dr. Terry, myself, Cody Swift, and Armando Loizaga from uh, Mexico. <clears throat> we also have a conservation committee, a gentleman from Mexico, Javier Sanchez. Miriam Volat from uh, River Sticks Foundation is the executive director of IPCI currently. Uh, Rafina Smith, uh, a Navajo woman who's living in San Antonio, Texas. Sandor, myself, Martin. Cody and James Botsford, one of our legal advisors from uh, Wisconsin. So I think monumentally, in October of 2017, we were able to buy with the, the support of uh, our amazing philanthropist, 605 acres in Jim Hogg County, Texas. Now, how remote and unpopulated is Jim Hogg County, Texas? There's one town in Jim Hogg County, Texas that has about 3,000 people. Uh, there are probably 10 times as many cows, maybe 100 times as many cows in Jim Hogg County as there are human beings. There is no building code in Jim Hogg County. We're, we're going to be be begin building uh, buildings on the land this year and we were amazed to find that we don't have to get any building permits. <laughs> so where in the world does that happen, right? The, the whole purpose for, again, the, the project is through, through the 605, the, what we're calling it, the 605 acres, is to reestablish a home for uh, pilgrimage, uh, for spiritual offerings, uh, for ceremony, uh, for camping, um, for youth immersion programs. Uh, we will ultimately have our own distributor um, under Texas law so that we can begin doing, setting up our own harvesting cooperative, uh, purchasing and selling. The leasing arrangements with the ranchers is vitally important, an educational campaign with the, with the ranchers, again, to try and begin to move them into more conscious, more aware kinds of land management practices. Um, and importantly, a nursery. So we hope to begin planting peyote in a nursery on the 605 so that over time, as we harvest off of the ranch properties, we'll be able to replant. So we harvest one, and the goal is to plant two peyote for every one that we harvest. Because again, from seed germination, it takes a decade before uh, you can uh, get a peyote to the point where it can be successfully harvested and sustainably harvested. So again, some more sensitive but beautiful pictures. This is from the, the 605 acres. There is an abundance of peyote on some parts of the 605 acres, but we know that if that were the only land where our people were harvesting, they would wipe out the peyote uh, on the land in probably a month's time. Talked about the spiritual reconnection. This is, again, it's from the, one of the children's harvests where we had a, an educational program before the harvest actually occurred last April. See the peyote button there, uh, a prayer being offered, probably corn pollen being offered uh, to the peyote. 
another offering. More offering. Many of these people, again, have never set foot in the peyote gardens before to harvest. Back to the land a little bit, we've been able to hire, again, with the resources made available to us, a conservation manager, Arnold Sloman, and his wife who are living on the land now in an RV. Um, and in October, a second conservation assistant, um, a gentleman uh, from Oklahoma, will be moving down uh, so that we will have two conservation families uh, living on the land. These people are absolutely essential to the success of this entire project, to have them living on the land, establishing their relationships with the ranchers. The one gentleman there in the 10-gallon hat, uh, Sandor is also there, and Mr. Sloman and his wife, but Isidro Gutierrez is a, a rancher down there who's become a, a very, very close friend of ours. We, we absolutely love Isidro, and he's helped to introduce us to other ranchers. And this was taken actually at the Customs and Border Patrol office uh, down there because we also have to establish relationships with law enforcement so, so that the, you know, the prosecutor in the county and the county sheriff, we've had them out to the ranch, the, the customs people, this is all upfront, open and transparent um, uh, initiative down there. <laughs> The gentleman on the right, this is Sandor, and then his wife, Geraldine, and Pedro Pizarro, um, an architect from Monterey, Mexico, who specializes in um, uh, straw bale and adobe construction, and the, pro the, the buildings that are going up on the land beginning in October will be built of natural uh, materials from our own land. This is part, an overview of part of the 605 acres, and it's, it's hard to make it out, but through our board and our conservation committee, we've laid out a whole development plan for the 605 acres. There will be dormitories, uh, there will be uh, bathhouses, kitchens, campground areas, spiritual offering areas, uh, and, and youth program areas uh, developed over time just conceptual drawings for the kinds of uh, uh, buildings that could be constructed down there. More of the same. So again, I hope that by sharing with you today uh, and talking about a very sensitive and delicate issue, um, we can help to build education, awareness, sensitivity among the non-indigenous population. Um, that peyote in Texas is, and for a long time, will remain in a state of crisis. You know, we're, we're laying the seeds, laying the foundation of this project now, but I won't see the full benefit of this. I, I, probably none of us in this room, but maybe our children and grandchildren. And, 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 and the children and grandchildren of the Native American church leaders that we work with uh, will see the benefits of this. But, you know, first and foremost, they believe that they're not doing this for themselves but for the generations unseen. So I'm happy to, if I have a little bit of time for questions, uh, to take questions. And um, I think that's it. There's a shot from Sunset on the 605. So. It's an amazing place. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Steve. Give him a, another big round of applause. And we have a bit of time for questions. If anybody has a question, there's a question there. Hi. Um, hi. <laughs> I'm a field biologist uh, based in Las Vegas, but I work throughout the whole Mojave Desert, so I'm pretty familiar with the Endangered Species Act. Um, I mostly work with desert tortoises. Um, they're in the Nevada State rape Reptile on the endangered species list. So, um, for example, if someone wants to build a house, let's say in Las Vegas, 
they're required by law to send one of us to their private land to do a survey for desert tortoise, and they have to be mitigated for, um, whether it's translocated or um, the burrows collapsed or whatever. Um, I'm not sure why that wouldn't apply. The Endangered Species Act rules would not apply for peyote on private land, considering it is an endangered species. Sorry, I'm not sure why the same rules wouldn't apply for peyote. I can't hear. Desert tortoises, yes. Oh, okay, I missed that first pers pers But for example, in California, when I've worked with the Coachella Valley milk vetch, um, that's also uh, has to be protected as well. But so that's really bizarre that it doesn't apply. Okay, I don't know about the rules in Texas. Okay. We are in the process of getting a, a, a oh, yeah, are we able to get any tax benefits either, e either from the ag status? And, and, and the answer is yes, this is zoned ag land and very little taxes. I mean, for 600 acres, it's, I think it's less than $1,000 a year. Yeah, I mean, we've looked at the, the, the religious exemption, but we're not sure that we even need to deal with that. How do the children who participate in, in these rituals, and I, this is also a question for, uh, for, for Ben, too. And Ben, too. Um, I'm aware that Native American women take peyote when they're pregnant. Yeah, yeah. And I know that there is some doctoring that's done with peyote. So like when children are teething, you know, they will put a peyote tea on the gums of the children. So yeah, it, it's something that's done from in utero. Yeah, and safely. I also have known uh, roadmen uh, that have, have led ceremonies their entire lives. They're in their mid 80s now. Uh, so they've been eating peyote every week for decades. And they're some of the strongest, most beautiful people I know. And Ben, that same question to Ben, too, I think. Yeah, with the, with the boga, with the boga, um, the ritual I, I filmed the woman, she was being initiated, she actually gave, she was breastfeeding her newborn baby. So, so there it's from very, very young. Um, you know, generally initiation starts with seven years old uh, or longer. People can choose, so it's a choice, but it's from very young. And with ayahuasca, it depends as well. In some more the religious communities, they also, when they're pregnant, drink. In Colombia, where I was, I don't think they, they do that. But uh, also there were kids, I think five, seven years old, that were also drinking in the, in the ceremony. So it's, it's, an inter it's like, a, as I said, the university of life from very young, and it's part of the education system, actually. Mm. Uh, yeah, so... The law in Texas is silent on moving plants. Now, all of our experimental work, research work right now is being done through Dr. Terry, who's emeritus, but he's, he still has a status at Sol Ross University. And he's had a DEA research license for over 20 years. So, you know, everything that we're doing now is under the guise of scientific research. But, you know, we do think that if if Texas tried to shut down any of our conservation activities, first of all, um, we think it would be foolhardy of them to do it. 
but it's why we're building that, uh, those relationships from the ground up, you know, so that we have the ranchers, so that we have the local prosecutor, the local um, county sheriff, Customs and Border Patrol, and DEA in Texas are all aware of what we're doing. I mean, if we, if we had to litigate, I think under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, federal and, and Texas also has a Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I mean, if forced to litigate this issue, we'll litigate it. I don't think we would lose. I don't think the state has, of Texas has a compelling, the state of Texas does not have a compelling interest under, the, under that standard to shut down what we're doing. But, you know, we expect fully that we'll just be able to avoid all of those kinds of c conflicts and, and contentious uh, uh, attitudes by educating people. Yeah. Um, what's the ideal soil mix and composition when you're growing pe peyote in like a greenhouse environment? And are there any commercial cactus soil mix like products that already have it, uh, you know, perfect for peyote? I'm aware that there are greenhouses in Europe that successfully grow peyote. Um, I, I think that there are some commercial soil mixes. Um, the ideal soil is found in, it's the caliche soil, the limestone soil in, in Texas um, along this particular ridge line. Um, and, and you see the curvature of you know, the border between the United States and Mexico takes that big dip, you know, where the river is. And so, there, you know, there's a whole geographic uh, phenomena, uh, this kind of upswell uh, on, on the American side of that. And it's along that ridge line where the right uh, caliche soil is found. Uh, you know, we looked into artificial harvesting, uh, but we, ha we have the natural habitat in Texas. And, it's very expensive to build a greenhouse and to try and propagate peyote under artificial conditions like that, especially when you've got a 10-year harvest horizon, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so we figured that the money was better spent by putting it in, investing it into a ranch in Texas. We can germinate the seeds in a greenhouse, per perhaps, but then move them when they get stable enough uh, move them quickly in compostable pots right into the caliche soil in Texas. We, can, we will be able to control, you know, some of the environmental conditions, maybe with some shade structures if necessary, and some artificial um, uh, irrigation. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're still in the fledgling stages right now and have not gotten that far into the project yet. Thank you for your work that you're doing and for presenting to us. Please correct me if, if, uh, if I didn't understand correctly. On the 605-acre farm that the IPCC and yourself are buying to conserve the Hikuri medicine, there's plans to harvest and distribute or sell to Native American churches. Is that correct? No. Uh if I, if I didn't speak clearly about that, there's, there, there are places on the land, on the 605, that have uh, a pretty uh, abundant um, uh, peyote, but not the entire 605, you know. Uh, part of it is along that ridge line. Uh, when you get further east up on the flat top, uh, it, it, there's no, it's the wrong soil and there's no peyote. So of the 600 acres, there may be you know, maybe 200 acres that have peyote, um, and, and that would be quickly wiped out if we were to open it up for harvesting. You know, we have, uh, this year we're signing leases with ranchers. You know, we hope in the next, say, three years to have 10,000 acres under lease agreements so that we can be doing harvesting on the ranch properties in the county. Did I understand that your organization will be distributing or, or selling the peyote? We can only sell it with one of those Texas distributor licenses. And 
and, and, and we have those plans, um, but we, we, have, we have not secured the license yet. Yeah. Again, there are a group of uh, Peoteros down there, distributors, and um, we, we realize that over time uh, there will always be a need for, um, people will always have a need to pick up the phone and call and place an order for peyote. It won't, be a, it won't be possible for everyone to make these kind of pilgrimages down to Texas and do their own harvesting. But, you know, the, the leaders of our organizations that helped us create IPCI have, have wanted to do this, to, to make that reconnection, that spiritual reconnection to Texas. Good questions. All right, the, the time is up for this session, so give a last round of applause for Steve. <laughs> and so we have we have five.